Hey, good afternoon, early evening, everyone. Uh, I'd like to um, uh, discuss, again, something from the last Parsha and see if we can relate it to Hanukkah, which, as you know, the first candle we light, uh, is Hashem, is this, is this Thursday evening. Um, there, uh, there was a Rav, I'm not sure if you're familiar, he's not one of the more popular Rabbonim of the, of the 20th century, uh, Harav Menachem Ben Sion Zaks, uh, sat, not related to the former chief rabbi, uh, uh, who um, was a fourth generation Israeli, uh, received smicha from Rav Cook uh, when he was 18 years old here, uh, eventually emigrated to the United States, uh, to Chicago, and um, was responsible, other than being a anyone who's here from Chicago, uh, being the Rosh Yeshiva at, at Skokie, but also uh, established the Ida Crown, uh, the Ida Crown School and other uh, educational institutions. Is quite an impressive person. Um, and he, he passed away about, um, about 30 years ago, um, lived into his 90s. He published a number of books uh, and... Um, he there was a two volume work that he published on the parsha, which um, I fortunately was able to uh, purchase many many years ago, and his comments on the parsha are not only creative but very very relevant and and as you'll see in a minute, his uh, one of his comments on last week's parsha actually I at least in my opinion certainly speaks to us and speaks to the situation in which we're in which is, of course, a difficult situation for everyone, especially for most of us, I imagine, who have somebody, a relative or a friend, who is presently serving in Sahau and defending us. Uh, we wish them haslocha, and they should be menatzeach, and, and the mida keneged mida, punish the, uh, the wicked Hamas. On, uh, in last week's Parsha, we read <clears throat> that uh, after Yaakov's uh, famous uh, battle with the angel, with the strange, mysterious man, who uh, Chazal tell us was Saraso Shalesov, the the angel of Esav. So he leaves limping, and then <clears throat> we're told by Yisrach Lo Hashemesh that the morning after the uh, the match took place in the evening, he by Yisrach Lo Hashemesh the sun rose for him. So Rashi makes a comment, and Rashi connects this to uh, another time the, uh, the son uh, was connected to Yaakov, and that is when he left Be'er Sheva, Vayetze Yaakov mi Be'er Sheva, Vayelech Harana, Vayivgav HaMakom, Vayolen Shon Kivo HaShemesh. So Rashi says he, he slept in that place, that was where he had the famous dream of the ladder, and in order for him to sleep in that place, so Rashi says, based on a Medrash Tanchuma, that the sun set early. So the day was shortened. So in order for, I guess, astronomically speaking, for things to balance out. So now, after his battle with uh, the Saraso Shalesov, now the day, the day began earlier. Vayizrach lo Hashemish, the day began earlier, the sun rose earlier, in order to make up for the time, the daylight that was lost uh, some uh, some twenty some twenty years ago, so there is this connection between the sun setting and the sun rising. Fine. There is a Gemara uh, in Chulin which uh, references the same Medrash, but in the context of a story. And the story goes something like this: Rabbi Akiva uh, finds himself uh, with his uh, Rabbi Gamliel and uh, with Rabbi Yoshua two of his contemporaries, the great Tanoi, after the destruction of the second temple. And they're in a market to buy an animal to slaughter, to provide food for the wedding feast for Rabbi Gamliel's son, Rav Shimon ben Gamliel. And at that, while they're in this marketplace picking an animal, you know, that whose meat would be used for the wedding celebration, Rabbi Akiva poses a question to them, well, out of the blue. Rabbi Akiva says, it says, Vayizrach lo Hashemesh, and the sun rose for him. This is after his battle with the angel. So Rabbi Akiva says, the sun only rose for him? Doesn't the sun rise for the entire world? 
So uh, the Gemara comments, and I'm reading uh, what the Gemara says in Chulin, to teach us, Shemesh Habo Bavuro Zarach Bavuro, the same sun, the same sun that set for him 20 years earlier was now the same sun that rose for him. And that's the simple interpretation. So comes along the Menachem Tzion. This is the, this is the name of the book, the two-volume work in the parsha that Rabbi Menachem Mendel uh, Ben Tzion, uh, uh, sorry, uh, that Menachem Ben Tzion, Zach's published. He says, what's going on here? I mean, what's this story about? Is it just to be taken at face value? Is there something more here? And he makes this incredible suggestion, which is, is so, which sort of, you know, uh, seems like it's probably the right interpretation. He says, Rabbi Akiva and his colleagues were living in the wake of the destruction of the Second Temple. The Churban Bayasheni was catastrophic. Uh, we're still living in the shadow of Churban Bayasheni. The Third Temple has not been built. The number of Jews that were uh, that that died in the war against Rome, and then later on in the Bar Kokhba rebellion, probably numbered into you know close to a million, if not more. Many were sold as slaves. Many be many were forced to become gladiators. It, it was it was a very after the after the destruction of the Second Temple, the mood in Israel was a mood of despair, of depression. Um, it, people had basically given up hope. It, how do we know this? Because the Gemara in Bava Basra, at the end of the third parak in Cheska Sabatim, tells us this a, 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 a remarkable discussion where Chazal felt that basically the Jewish people had come to an end. And they said, we're going to forbid anyone getting married and anyone having children. They had a thought to enact a Gezerah, a decree, forbidding anyone to get married, anyone to have children. That, that was the mood. That was the mood. It was a mood of total and utter despair of Yehosh. Of course, they never implemented it, okay? But the fact that they even thought of doing it gives us a window into the mood of the people in the wake of the destruction of the Second Temple. They thought it was over. Judaism was over. The Jewish people were over. That's it. Let let us simply die out, and that's it. That was the mood. Into that, into that dark and black atmosphere arose the great optimist, Rabbi Akiva. Now, we know that Rabbi Akiva was the optimist, the great Tana of hope and faith. And how do we know this? Because the Gemara tells us at the end of uh, Makos, the very famous story that Rabbi Akiva was walking looking at the ruins of the second temple along with his colleagues, Rabbi Tarf and Rabbi Yoshua, Rabbi Eliezer and others. And he saw that they were crying and he was laughing. So they asked him, why are you laughing? He said, why are you crying? Why are we crying? The, temp- the temple is, the temple area is desolate. There's been a churba, there's been a terrible destruction. Why shouldn't we cry? He said, well, why are you laughing? So he said, I'm laughing because there were prophecies about what would happen. And now that the prophecy of destruction took place, and I see that was meant literally, there was also the prophecy that there would ultimately be a redemption. And if the first prophecy came true, then the second prophecy also is going to come true. And the Gemara says that the, his colleague said, Nicham Tanu, you consoled us, Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Akiva had now, it didn't, the, the Geula did not happen in his lifetime. Rabbi Akiva, the Gemara says, he in the Baruchos was tortured to death. And the Bar Kokhva rebellion did not succeed. But that didn't stop Rabbi Akiva from believing that there would ultimately be a Geula. Now, so here we have Rabbi Akiva. So now, here's where Rabbi Zaks comes in and has a completely different read on that story that took place in that marketplace where they were buying food for the wedding of Rabbi Gamliel's son. He said, Rabbi Akiva noticed that Rabbi Gamliel was depressed. Why was he depressed? Rabbi Gamliel was probably thinking, why are we having a wedding? A wedding for my son. Rome is still, you know, with its power, with its viciousness, trying to stamp out any, any remnant of Jewish life. He says, why should we have a wedding? Why should we celebrate? How can we celebrate? It's impossible. Rabbi Akiva noticed the despondency 
and the pessimism of his friends. And Rabbi Akiva then asked the question. He said, isn't it interesting that the Torah says, Vayizrach lo Hashemesh. He asked him a question, he says, did the sun only rise for Yaakov? Didn't it rise for the whole world? And then he answers, he said, to teach us that the sun that set for Yaakov rose for Yaakov. And then he says to his colleagues, and get in the words of Rabbi Zaks, sometimes in our history, we experience the setting sun. Everything looks bleak. Everything looks black and dark without any hope, without any future. And people, understandably, may simply want to give up, you know, and they cannot sustain their faith, and they feel weak. Rabbi Akiva said, if that's true, we've experienced many a setting of the sun, many a dark period of persecution, but the same sun that sets is the same sun that will rise. We don't know when, but there will be a Zerich HaSachama, a Netzachama. The sun is the same sun that sets, is that same sun that's going to rise. There will be, just like it was for Yaakov, with the rising of the sun, the Medrash says Yaakov was healed of his limp. He comes to Shechem, Shalem Begufo, Shalem Bimamono, Shalem Bitaraso. In other words, this, the rising of the sun brought back Yaakov into his vigor, physically, spiritually, religiously. So Rabbi Akiva said, we need to have the wedding. And with the wedding, we are protesting against the end of the Jewish people. We will continue on. This was the optimism, the indomitable faith of Rabbi Akiva, the courageous, the courageous faith of Rabbi Akiva. He wouldn't give up. So this is, this is the comment of Rabbi, of Rabbi Zaks. I thought when I came across, I thought it was absolutely incredible because it speaks so much to, uh, you know, speaks so much to all of us who, who find ourselves in what appears to be two months ago, a horrific setting of the sun, which we never thought would happen. And again, we all know the, tr the terrible tragedy and calamity that took place. And now we're still in this period. The war rages. Hostages are still held captive. And who knows what sort of condition they're in. We've already heard, again, reports. I'm sure you've read it as well. It's not, it's not, a, it's not an optimistic picture. And yet, even though that may be the case, and even though right now, we're all struggling to deal with this. And when will it end? And when will our soldiers come home and the hostages be brought, be brought back home? And when, when can we eradicate Hamas so we can have peace on our southern border and take care of Hezbollah on the northern border? When can we be vindicated in the eyes of the world, which just looks for reasons to accuse us? So we have to defend ourselves for defending ourselves. When will that stop? We don't know. But we have to believe just like we may be experiencing now a setting of the sun, we have to believe, as Rabbi Akiva taught, there will be a zuricha sachama, there will be a rising of the sun, a strong belief that everything that we stand for, everything that we've been trying to preach, everything that Torah stands for, will ultimately be vindicated not only for Jews throughout the world, but also for the non-Jewish world as well. I think this is a powerful lesson, and it's we, we need to maintain our optimism. I'm sure you've seen videos, I've seen videos of the soldiers who, uh, you know, they're dancing and they're celebrating Shabbos, and when one soldier has a simcha that he can't go, you know, so they all celebrate with him together. It's It's an incredible thing to see the faith of those who are battling for us, and we have to share that faith. And we have to give them chizuk and give ourselves chizuk. So I think the words of Rabbi Zaks are so, are so very relevant. I, I'd like to connect this with Hanukkah, if I may, because, again, you're dealing with the Zerich HaSachama, you're dealing with light. I mean, what is Hanukkah if not a holiday of light? When candles are lit amidst the darkness and the candles illuminate, illuminate the entire room, the entire house, the entire world. I mean, isn't that what Hanukkah is about? So there is a discussion, 
Again, this is, can be uh, expanded to Oshir, but an interesting discussion, an insight of Rav Salavechik, who asked a question. He said, when did the custom come about to light the menorah in our homes? Where Chazal made a takana that Hanukkah is celebrated by lighting the menorah in our homes. And in fact, Chazal say that the lighting of the menorah is a chovas habayis. It's an obligation on the home. When did that happen historically? So if you examine the historical record, the secular, I could say the secular record of that time, namely uh, the uh, antiquity of the Jews by Josephus and the Sefer HaMakabim, we don't know who the authors were, we find something absolutely remarkable. When they speak, they speak about what happened. The Maccabees, how they defeated the Greeks and how they celebrated on the 25th day of Kislev. There is no mention of the lighting of the menorah as we know it. No mention at all. They speak about rededicating the Mizbeach and, and the sacrificial and the sacrificial service. They speak about um, celebrating, you know, celebrating the victory of lighting the menorah in the base Hamigdash. But all that's true. But there's no mention anywhere that there was a custom that arose that in everyone's home we should light the menorah. That was that's not discussed at all. And it's and, and Josephus was way after the story of Hanukkah. I'm not sure when the Sefer Hamakabim were written, but it's a very interesting question. When did this custom start? So Rasalovechik, based upon a reading of the Rambam, Rasalovechik congestures that the, the uh, custom that we have of lighting the menorah in the home started after the destruction of the second temple. Before the destruction of the second temple, the only menorah that was lit was in the base Hamikdash. And then, you know, there was a miracle. You know, the Gemara says in Yuma that the, um, the Ner HaMaravi, the Western candle, remained lit even though theoretically the fuel did not support the lit candle for the entire day. So the Jewish people were not unaccustomed to seeing a miracle associated with the menorah. But after the destruction of the second temple, there's no Beis Hamikdash, there's no menorah. At that point, Chazal were faced with a very, very serious problem. Much like we said before, that after in the wake of the destruction of the second temple, so many people thought that Judaism was over. So many people gave up, like we said, quoted the Gemara, the end of the third paragraph in Baba Basra. They wanted to forbid people from getting married. The mood again was pessimistic. The mood was filled with despair in Yeosh. And at that point, Chazal needed to do something to convince the people that as terrible and as tragic as the destruction of the second temple was, this did not mark Chalila, the end of the Jewish people. And so they reminded us of something. And there's a Gemara, the Gemara in Yuma comments. The Gemara says about the menorah in the base Hamigdash, Vechila Orahu Tzarech. Gemara said, what was the purpose of the menorah in the base Hamigdash? Was it for illumination? And the Gemara says, absolutely not. Absolutely not. So what was the purpose of the menorah in the base Hamigdash, if not for illumination? Why did they like the menorah? So the Gemara says, because edus hi leboi olam, it would be an everlasting testimony to everyone in the world, shashchina shora Israel, that God's presence resides in Israel. In other words, the lighting of the menorah, the base Hamikdash, was not for illumination, but to remind us and everyone else that God's presence resides with us. That idea. After the destruction of the second temple, there's no menorah anymore. Chazal said, we're going to take a menorah and no longer, no base amigdash, and we're going to place it in the home and we're going to light the menorah. And you know the halacha. The purpose of the candles is not for illumination. You can't read anything by the candles of the menorah. That's why one of the reasons we have a shamash. You can't use the candles for anything. So what's the purpose if they're not there for illumination? So Hazal said, to remind us in this long gullus, this long, long gullus, where so many people think that maybe Hashem has abandoned us, 
those candles remind us, just like the candles in the base Hamigdash, that God's presence had never, has never left the Jewish people. It may look that way. It may look that way, but God's presence had ne- has never, never left. It was then and no different today. So I see that same idea. The sun rises for Yaakov and for all of us. And even though it hasn't completely risen, we haven't reached the point of Gula, the Hanukkah menorah reminds us, Shashchina Shora Israel, that God's presence is still with us, is still with us. And if we believe that, really believe that, and live in accordance, knowing that God is close to us and he cares about us, not only will we win this battle, Yitz Hashem, but ultimately all of us can help pave the way to the ultimate Gula Shlema. Have a happy Hanukkah, everyone, and uh, have a great week. Thank you for listening.